Going back and looking at previous games is one of the best ways to improve as a player in any competitive setting, esports or otherwise. So join us this week where we'll show you how to perform full match, sequence and basic stats analysis to help you grind comp queue less while developing new habits to learn and improve more quickly. This week's performance analysis basics video has got you covered. Welcome back, Banadam here. Last week we discovered what performance analysis is in basic terms and you can find that video in the top corner card of your screen now. I recommend going back and watching our initial video and coming back here afterwards to get a full appreciation of what's going on. The video is split into four distinct sections and these are listed on the screen now. How to develop full match analysis, how to develop sequence analysis and how to develop statistical analysis. Finally, we'll bring it all together to help make appropriate actions and targets for the player. The timestamps for all of these sections are in the description box, and if you'd like to skip ahead to any part of that sequence, you can look below. Additionally, any of the files or videos that we've used in this video are also linked in the description, so if you want to go and have a look at those in more depth, you can do that whenever you want. So first of all, let's look at full match analysis. For the full match analysis of the game, I begin with a table and slowly go through and mark down events that occur as the match proceeds. You can see this on the screen now. These type of events could be assists, deaths, kills, an objective being taken, a shot being taken in a game like Rocket League, or anything that really is deemed important or noteworthy in terms of how the game moves on. You should try and make a list of all your actions and see what they lead to, filling in the middle column on the document provided too and pausing the video when required. When doing this you can also use it as an opportunity to take screenshots and timestamps and even annotate any diagrams using basic programs like Paint. This type of method allows you to identify any specific points you may wish to performance analysis later or where you're going into much more detail and look at sequence analysis where you look at things like kills and the events before them, rotations in games like League of Legends, or even a site being taken in other games like Valorant or Counter-Strike. By the end of the match, you should have something that kind of looks like this, where again in the description if you want a blank document or you want to see what we've written, you can go ahead and click it whenever you like. Now we've completed our full match analysis, we can move on to identifying a sequence. Sequence analysis takes on a much smaller area of the match and focuses on events that occurred within it on a second by second basis. You can see in the example given, I've chosen a moment in the game where I take enemy fire and I don't keep the angle covered for my team, and even though we end up securing one kill, it actually leads to both myself and my teammate being flanked. After analysing the clip, I realised what mistakes I made, and now I know I can sometimes have a habit of not checking angles when giving up ground. In this type of analysis, screenshots may add the explanation, but it is more of a deep dive into the micro events which lead to the events unfolding. You can see the analysis we did here was much more in depth for this sequence than the match version of the Word document, which is the whole point of this type of analysis. Because it focuses on such a small area of the game, it means that much smaller and minute events can be documented. This can often lead to things like mechanics or positional errors being brought up, which typically in a match analysis may not come up because of the way that certain events may be glossed over. For the statistical analysis of the game, we've taken the stats from Tracker GG and used that in combination with some of the stats we could get from the post-game lobby. You can see in this match that the KD spread of the play was actually quite good, and even though that does look like something that's good on the surface, sometimes you need to dig deeper to really find out why something like that happened. In this case, the player was playing at a lower rank than what they're actually used to, and what that means is that the enemy were presenting more mistakes than someone of equivalent rank. The player did have a low number of assists but a high number of kills and damage, and this may mean that they were taking the initiative in a lot of the fights that unfolded. The player must also be helping the team, and not just last hitting either, which means that they're actually taking a lot more initiative than what was initially thought. The damage taken and the death count is also very low, which means that either unfavourable fights were avoided, or it could mean that the player was actually too passive. This is the kind of situation where having a video to back up the statistics makes the analysis so much better. 
the level of play that was seen here, the player's accuracy is actually quite low. And even though we said earlier the player was playing at a lower rank than what they're used to, this would mean the players that they're against shouldn't really be strafing as much. And even with that in mind, the player scored an accuracy rating of less than 50% and acquired no perfect medals for landing all the shots of a battle rifle exchange onto the enemy. Additionally, another thing that you can see from the statistics is that the player made no ping call outs. And even though the voice call wasn't added into this game, I can assure you that there were communications that were not recorded where the player did call out. And so again, this is an instance where statistics need to be taken in carefully. Another way we can interpret the stats from a game is by looking at a kill and death map. And you can see on the screen here that every single kill has been marked by a black arrow and every single death has been marked by a red one. It's important to realise that things like this should definitely be used in conjunction with video, but what this can highlight is patterns in play, especially in games like Rocket League, and it can also look at habits that players have when certain things occur, such as where they like to hang around when weak, where they might die a lot, or where they like to play aggressively and play most of the match. These types of stats can be really helpful to see where the player was rotating and to see how the team was actually forming themselves during the game. And with the right tools, this sort of information can be used to make things like heat maps, which are actually quite common in first person shooters. When bringing all of this information together, it's always important to maintain context. We've looked at a sequence, we've looked at the full match, and now we've looked at the stats. Bringing all of this together, we can make some statements about the game to see how the player played well, and see some areas of development that the player could focus on. This is typically done in something called a SWOT analysis, where we look at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You may have seen something like this before, used in a slightly different way. As we said before, the strengths that we look at are some of the positive things from the match. The weaknesses are some of the negative things. Opportunities could be things that arise from the player's strengths. For example, the player in this match liked to use movement tech like slide cancelling and jumping up and clambering on items that usually require a slightly higher jump. The player could then double down on this and investigate further ways to use movement tech on the map. The threats, on the other hand, are things that could happen due to some of the weaknesses of the player. In this case, we've highlighted the poor swing angles caused for modules to be lost, and you could see this when we looked at the sequence earlier in the match. This means the player really needs to focus on looking at corners as they go around, as in higher ranked player, this could be a real issue. From the opportunities and threats that we found, we can then make targets for the player, and these are shown on the screen now, based on the things that we've found out so far. It's important to remember that when making targets for a player, they should always be appropriate for the rank, and it's no good telling a new player to go and watch professionals in pre-made matches when they don't really have any idea what's going on. You should always set appropriate targets. This is reflected further in the actions that are set for a player as well, and especially if they're a new player, it's no good setting highly mechanically complex things for them to go and learn. You really want them to start off with the basics. In case of this player, We've given them four actions based on some of the things we found out in the SWOT analysis. And from this, we've developed a range of tasks with next steps and back to basics that they can use to develop in the future. It's important when coaching players and doing performance analysis that tasks and steps that are given are, again, relevant to the rank and skill level of the player. You should also give them something to look at if they're successful and something to look at if they find things more difficult. It's no good setting unrealistic or too easy targets because if the player isn't moved out of their comfort zone, they're not going to progress. And if the player is given something that's too difficult, they're going to become frustrated and give up. And that finishes off our basic introduction to performance analysis for Unit 2. Hopefully you found these videos helpful. Performance analysis is something that many sports students tend to be familiar with, but many esports students and gamers tend to sort of not really do and it's a shame because most of the learning in solo queue and things like that in competitive play comes from looking at issues that a player has or strong points that they have and then doubling down or developing those weaknesses you can go and look at many articles that exist on many different teams and you'll find the story is the same and professional teams are putting a lot of resources into effective coaching and performance management and it's been that way for decades in traditional sports already 
If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like so we know that this format is working. And if you really enjoy the content on the channel, consider subscribing so you get a new video every Friday. We'll be looking back at Unit 1 next week, but we're also thinking about looking at some stuff that's not necessarily on BTEC that we think some of our viewers might enjoy. So if you've got any questions, drop them below. If you enjoyed the video, give us a subscribe and see you in the next one. See you later.